Coming up, lessons learned, what you should know about the coronavirus four years later. Then Ramadan begins. We'll take a look at this holiday celebrated by more than a billion people around the world. Also, around the globe, we're heading to Ireland to answer your questions about this country, St. Patrick's Day, and more. My question is, why in St. Pa Patrick's Day almost everything is green? Plus, sailing into history, this American woman just sailed all the way around the world and into the record books. Solo sailors, uh, you have to be able to do everything. You need to be able to take care of yourself. And you need to be able to get up even when you're so exhausted. And you have to be able to fix everything on the boat. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. I'm happy to be with you. We've got a wonderful lineup ahead today. March is National Reading Month, and two friends from Sesame Street are here to share an important message. You know what I love about reading is that it takes me to different places mm. in my imagination. Like when I read a book, I can imagine I'm on the moon, I can be in a fairy garden. Plus, a little later on, we're in Pennsylvania for our picture of the week. But first, let's begin with one of the stories making headlines this week. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump have secured enough delegates to clinch their party's presidential nominations. They both became what we say were presumptive nominees earlier this week, crossing the delegate threshold by winning Tuesday's primary contests. So this means the two will face off in the November presidential election. Meantime, another story in the news this week, the coronavirus. Four years ago this week, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. We know those were scary times. We spent a lot of time in this program answering your questions and trying to help you understand what was happening. Joining us now in our Ask the Doc series is our good pal, Dr. John Torres. John, great to see you. I'm thinking you back during the pandemic, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have done this. No. Or if we would, we'd be measuring off six feet of distance. And we, wearing masks and being very concerned about the virus. A lot has changed. A lot has changed. March 2020, I mean, think about it, four years ago. And that's kind of the same time period, a little bit later, that we started this whole program. So this has been going on for a while, trying to answer questions for viewers. You know, a lot of this is the things we learned about the virus. And one of the biggest things we learned about the virus is just how tricky this virus is. And I don't know if you remember, <laughs> I remember. the good old... Good coronavirus old prop. <laughs> prop I used all the time. And one of the things we talked about, a lot of people learned a lot about science, especially kids. This thing here, the spike protein, that spike protein became all important because that's what lets the virus attach to the cell. And that's what changed when we talked about mutations, which a lot of people learned about. When this thing changes and mutates, it can start evading. It can start getting around the protections we have. And that's why it's important that we try to keep one step ahead or at least even with the changes that are happening in the virus. And we had we developed some good habits as, as a result of all this. Hand washing, uh, hand sanitizer. Those are things that are still paying dividends, I would think, even today. They are. And that's one of the things we found out as well. In addition to the vaccine, which is all important, that's the one big important thing you can do. We also found out that simple things really work. The mask, it really helps protect you from the virus. And if you're sick, it helps protect you from giving it to somebody else. On top of that, hand washing, simple hand hygiene, using hand sanitizer. You mentioned a six foot distance, ventilation, opening up windows in the classrooms and making sure students can get in there but in a healthy environment. Those are the things we found out that help, and they continue to help. And the other thing I remember strongly about those days were people came together. You know, and that's probably the biggest lesson we learned out of the whole thing is, you know, people came together. We decided, you know, we need to be ready for these things going forward. And so these are some of the lessons we're learning. But understanding that people come together, whether it's the whole nation, the whole world coming together to try and find out how to get that vaccine so quickly that can protect us trying to figure out how this virus spreads and how we can stop it from spreading. And even in the classrooms, your teacher figuring out with other teachers and with scientists how to keep you safe. It's important that we all came together, we learned these lessons, and we can continue these lessons moving forward. All right. Well, Doctor, thanks for so much for being here. And uh, great to not have a... Uh... Uh, great to have a less than six foot distance between each other. You know, the biggest thing I learned, yeah. juggling this whole time. And I don't know if you remember early on, I was juggling. These balls are going all over the place. So I'm going to see if I learned anything right, in these last few years. Anything. But look, a little bit better. And there goes some of them. That's what you did in your isolation. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs>
All right, while you work on your juggling, we're going to tell you about another story of importance. Families around the world celebrating the start of Ramadan this week. The holy month of Ramadan is the most important time of the year for Muslims, and it comes with special traditions. Let's get details now from our friend Raf Sanchez. Muslims around the world are observing Ramadan right now. The celebration of Ramadan is based on the cycle of the moon, which is why Ramadan begins on different dates each year. Ramadan starts with a crescent moon and ends with another crescent a month later. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. During the month of Ramadan, Muslims fast during the day. Fasting means not eating or drinking. For kids, it's usually a mini fast, a few hours each day. But why do Muslims fast? to remind yourself of what it's like to be hungry, so you have more compassion for those in need. It's also to help develop self-discipline while strengthening your faith. The big moment comes when the sun sets. First cooking, Allah. then prayers, then finally time to eat. This is the iftar dinner. Iftar means break fast, like breakfast. When you eat after a long time without food, it's one of Ramadan's holy traditions. During this month, we really do try and re reconnect with our religion and we try to pray as much as we can and really understand our religion more. Um, and it just gives us a chance to stop what we're doing, stop the world for a moment for that month and just really, really connect with our, with our God. More than a billion people around the world celebrate Ramadan from Saudi Arabia to England to America. A global community all sharing one belief. Ramadan is a holiday where friends and family come together. Islam has five main traditions. Fasting is one of them. Another, charity and helping others. And guess what? At the end of Ramadan, there's a big party with lots of food and presents. It's called Eid al-Fitr, a well-deserved celebration after a month of sacrifice. Okay, Raf, thanks very much. Now to our Around the Globe series, and this week we head to the Emerald Isle. We're talking about Ireland, where residents are getting ready to celebrate St. Patrick's Day this weekend. Let's get details from our friend Dylan Dreyer. What island country is known for its luck, filled with folklore, and may or may not have pots of gold at the end of every rainbow? If you guessed Ireland, you're right. It's a patchwork quilt uh, of different shades of green. Nicknamed the Emerald Isle, Ireland is the land of bright green fields and craggy coastlines. It's an island nation located on the westernmost edge of Europe. The official language is English and Gaelic, and farming is a big part of the economy. Ireland is also the land of myths and magic. Legend has it that if you hear the faint sound of hammering, it may just be a leprechaun. These mischievous little guys sport a hat and an apron, and they have two jobs, making shoes and putting that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I am still looking for a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's lots of rainbows in Ireland, and we see them all the time. They're very beautiful. Did you know that the national symbol of Ireland is the shamrock, which is actually a three-leaf clover? There are also four-leaf clovers, and if you have the luck of the Irish on your side, you may just find one. The four-leaf clover is the symbol for luck because it is rare. In Irish language, we have a, um, a shanuckle, which is the Irish for proverb, and that is on rodis anav is intuck, which means what is rare is wonderful. Um, so to have a four-leaf clover to find something so rare makes you super lucky. But if you're anything like me, the one thing I always think of when someone says Ireland is St. Patrick's Day, celebrated every year on March 17th. I wanted to learn more about the meaning behind the holiday, specifically about St. Patrick himself. St. Patrick Day commemorates the life and death of St. Patrick, who is the patron saint of Ireland. And because he's the patron saint, we also use it to celebrate uh, Irish culture and history as well. I was also curious about how they celebrated St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. Nearly every village and town will do a parade, kind of like a Mardi Gras wherein we'll have floats and performers performing on the streets. Uh, the capital of Ireland, which is Dublin, where I live, we have a five day long festival um, and there's the biggest parade and that goes on the TV. We usually wear shamrocks, which are a type of clover found in Ireland. 
um, or anything green will do. And we have traditional food, so we might eat Kilcannon, which is potatoes and cabbage. Don't knock it till you try it. St. Patrick's Day is a great time to focus in on um, what you already have, what makes you lucky in your life, because it's easy to know what you don't have, but it's not always so easy to see what you do have. Now that's my kind of holiday. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Dylan, thanks so much. And speaking of St. Patrick's Day, we just received this question from one of our viewers. Hi, my name is Oishani and I'm eight years old and I live in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. My question is, why in St. Pa Patrick's Day almost everything is green? Bye, I love 90 News Kids. Bye, we're always happy you're watching. That's a good question. Some historians believe that wearing green on St. Patrick's Day goes all the way back to the legend associated with leprechauns, those tiny fairies of Irish folklore. Others believe that the custom of wearing green may have come from the tradition of wearing a piece of shamrock on St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. And here's another fun fact about St. Patrick's Day in the United States. Did you know the city of Chicago dyes the Chicago River green every year in honor of St. Patrick's Day? That's right, Chicago Journeyman Plumbers Local 130 says it's been dyeing the river green for decades and it coincides with the city's annual St. Patrick's Day parade. I lived in Chicago for a long time, always look forward to the Green River. All right, let's switch gears and talk about a favorite subject of mine, reading. March is National Reading Month and two special friends from Sesame Street stopped by the Today Show this week to share why reading is so important to them. What do you love the most about reading? Oh my goodness. You know what I love about reading is that it takes me to different places mm -hmm. in my imagination. Like when I read a book, I can imagine I'm on the moon, mm -hmm. I can be in a fairy garden, I can be swimming with platypuses. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. Plat yeah, platypus. Platypi? Platypus. No, <laughs> actually platypus. I've learned a lot about them because yeah. I love books on it's nature. It's all in a book. Abby, you yeah. learned so much. Grover, what, what's your favorite kind of book? My favorite kind of book? Yeah. Any book about chickens. Chicken? He <laughs> loves yes. chickens. If it has a right. chicken on the cover, in the title, <laughs> or I see a chicken reading it on Sesame Street, I have to have that book. Yeah, um, he's not yes. kidding. He loves chickens. That's my thing for now. <laughs> for now. It used to be hamsters. Hey, hey, Abby, for any of the parents that are watching, yeah. what, what does it feel like when your parents read to you? Why is it so important mm. that they do that? Well, um, we have a lot of fun when we're reading because it's my mommy and usually my little brother, Rudy, who's Aww. really fun to read with because he laughs really? like a pot-bellied pig. <laughs> but sometimes my mommy and daddy, they do voices. And remember when I said about, like, we get to explore different places? Yeah. We talk about it, and sometimes we even act out the books. So Ooh, how not, fun. Yeah. yeah, I like to read books with my mommy, too. Yeah. Yeah, and she actually calls me her little audio book. Because I, I like to follow her around and read out loud wherever she goes. Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. Abby, what's your favorite kind of book to read? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Hmm. Well, I like books where, where people show courage. You know, like hmm. people get to be a hero and they stand up for someone oh. because it gives me the courage that I can do it, too. Makes me feel like a hero inside. Oh. Abby Cadabby and Grover, great advice, and thanks for stopping by. Now for our picture of the week. Two rescued puma cubs just celebrated their first birthday at the Philadelphia Zoo. The siblings joined the zoo family in early July after being rescued in Washington. We're told the cubs quickly became beloved by both the zoo staff and visitors. We wish them a happy first birthday. Finally, in our inspiring kids series this week, we introduce you to a young woman who just sailed into history, becoming the first American woman to race around the world alone. And now Cole Brower is hoping to inspire kids to dream big and never give up. Let's get the story from our friend, Emily Aketa. Sailing into Spain, this is a history-making moment for 29-year-old Cole Brower finishing second in the Global Solo Challenge and becoming the first American woman ever to race nonstop around the world alone. This is really cool. It's so overwhelming in every sense of the word. Celebrating after returning from her dangerous four-month journey at sea, she faced hurricane-force winds and 30-foot waves. Oh, I'm approaching. <laughs> 
Watch as rough seas throw Brower across her boat, badly injuring her rib. Brower set off in October and sailed roughly 30,000 miles from Spain down the west coast of Africa over to Australia and around the tip of South America before returning to the starting point. We talked to Brower 121 days into her historic trip. You wear so many hats on this journey. Solo sailors, uh, you have to be able to do everything. You need to be able to take care of yourself. You need to be able to get up even when you're so exhausted and you have to be able to fix everything on the boat. While alone on her boat, Brower used Starlink satellites to stay connected with her team in the US and the world on social media. As I said, pretty big waves. Sharing candid moments from life at sea with her more than 450,000 followers. It all makes it worth it when you come out here. Brower is the youngest sailor and the only woman of the 16 competitors in the race. More than half have already dropped out. She hopes her success will help steer the sport into a more inclusive front. It would be amazing if there was just one other girl that saw me and said, oh, I can do that too. Emily, thanks so much. And Cole, way to go. That's going to do it for us. Parent sister reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, grab the camera and email a video question to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching and remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.